So I'm Sunil Jaswani, this is Alex Jing. I'm a neurosurgeon, he's a vascular surgeon. We're both local here in North San Diego County. Um, how do I advance the slides? The big green button. Big green button, okay. Okay, so we're just quickly gonna talk about kind of how to formulate a working relationship between spine and vascular surgeons. So, so as we all know, I mean, we have various indications for anterior approaches to the spine uh, in which vascular surgery and having a vascular surgeon that's proficient in these approaches uh, makes our jobs and our lives as spine surgeons much, much easier and, and safer. Um, so, you know, most of us probably do anterior lumbar interbody fusions. Um, now we're seeing more and more of these anterior to psoas approaches uh, in which vascular surgeons have been, have been uh, uh, very helpful. And even in the, in the setting of neurogenic tumors, uh, like this, this picture here, we got a patient with a schwannoma, this is one that I'm doing in the next couple of weeks, just anterior to the L3 vertebral body. And you can see that it's encroaching upon the inferior vena cava. And I'll be definitely doing this with, with my vascular surgery colleagues in the next coming weeks. Um, how many of us, how many of you guys do approaches to your anterior lumbar spine by yourself without vascular surgery? Does anyone do it without vascular surgery support? How's your experience been? <laughs> are you get, what happens when you get a vascular complication? Are you calling them in or are you just dealing with it yourself or what happens there? <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, so, you know, as we all know, there are several advantages to going to the anterior approach. Uh, we can put a large footprint in, uh, into this space. We can more uh, accurately control segmental lordosis. We can put a nice wedge shape implant in there and really drive lordosis to what we want it to be as compared to posterior approaches when we're somewhat more limited by, you know, an anterior longitudinal ligament. Uh, we can provide indirect decompression. Uh, we can avoid the neural elements that we're going in anteriorly. Um, and with the, the retroperitoneal approaches, when you don't enter the, the peritoneum, you know, we have less of the complications associated with that uh, as well. Uh, but we all know that there are some downsides to going in to the, uh, to the anterior approach to the spine. Um, vascular injuries are our most feared complications, and which is why, you know, I feel that having vascular surgery on board is, 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 is very important. Um, there was a paper that came out in the Spine uh, Journal in 1993 that showed uh, overall vascular injury rates were as high as 15.6%. 15, 15 uh, and another paper more recently showed that uh, major vascular complications can be as high as 2.9%. Um, a more recent study, I think from last year, showed a 1.4% incidence of vascular injuries. And that was based on, on a large retrospective study. And most of these are venous injuries at L45. Um, most of the venous injuries that we do see usually involve the iliac vein or the inferior vena cava uh, laceration or uh, during mobilization of the iliolumbar vein at, at L45. Um, you know, this has happened to me a couple of times. This has happened to you a couple of times. Um, yeah, and, and do it up eventually. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you can get arterial injuries coming from the middle sacral artery uh, or from the iliac artery, or you can get... Uh, uh, thrombosis of the artery or the vein. Um, Actually, yeah. going back one second. Um, yeah. So those numbers are really high. Like, uh, I think as you become more experienced or your access surgeon has more experience, even 1.4% is, I think, unacceptably <laughs> high for this particular operation. And there's different, you know, categorizations of vascular injuries. There's, I think when you have one, you know, when you have real so I think 1.4 is probably high and 15.6 is a little bit ridiculous actually. So um, and it depends too, it, I think it also depends too, I, I categorize vascular injuries into two categories. If you're doing a virgin admin or if you're doing a revision, same level surgery, then those I think are two different categories. And you know, I don't know my, my sphincter is a little puckered up when we're doing a revision case because it, the injuries are much more significant. Um, this is just kind of a, a diagram of all the different landmines. Uh, so you got the middle sacral arteries down below that can sometimes be kind of hidden there and it's easy to get into those and cause some bleeding. Um, the iliolumbar vein coming off uh, the side, which needs to be mobilized at L45, um, that, that can be torn during that mobilization causing bleeding issues. 
Uh, oftentimes you have to ligate the segmental vessels, the segmental artery of the vein. And so, so there's the vascular pitfalls, which, which I feel uh, in, my, in my practice makes having vascular surgery present much, much, efficient, much more efficient and safer. Um, so I think, you know, developing a good collaboration with vascular surgery is, is really important for these surgeries, uh, both in the preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative periods. Um, it's really important to be able to identify certain risk factors in, in preoperative planning. Uh, so I send my patients, uh, you know, to consult with vascular surgery independently from me uh, if we're considering an anterior, an a lip surgery. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's important to review imaging, to, you know, because there's a lot of variation. And, you know, Alex, you can talk more about this as far as the variation of the venous anatomy. Um, I think one paper showed there's there's a pretty high rate of um, duplication of the iliolumbar veins. The bifurcations could be higher or lower than we could expect. And I think these anatomical variations are important to recognize uh, before we go in based on imaging studies, because it, it kind of it kind of gives you a roadmap of what to expect when you get in there. I don't know if you want to, you know, add some comment about this. And that. No, it's definitely and, interesting. You know, um, from personal experience, I didn't do really any of this exposure stuff during training. So I learned it when I came out and it's interesting because I didn't really know all the venous anatomy, even though I'm a vascular surgeon <laughs> or, <laughs> or all the uh, variants that you run into. Truthfully, I didn't really know how to read an MRI before I started doing these, but it's something that you learn. And I think in terms of talking about, you know, the collaboration, you know, at the beginning, you know, I was very fortunate, one, to be in San Diego where there's a lot of industry support. So I was able to kind of bounce things off of people and learn. You know, I think one of the tricks is you can be a good technical surgeon, but there are all these little tricks that help you avoid pitfalls, which I think is the biggest thing. Um, and so certainly that was a big learning curve for me at the beginning, uh, just kind of going through both the MRIs, the imaging. And I didn't know, you know, you guys have all these like uh, acronyms for everything. I didn't know what A-LIF and X-A-LIF and Crest, all these different things uh, were. And so it took a while to learn those things. And I think patience in terms of kind of developing that relationship is important. Um, and then ultimately it becomes really kind of quick and easy once that has happened, because a lot of times I'll just call and I'll see the patient and be like, oh, this is going to be tricky because of this, or we may, you know, this is going to be a revision, or this guy has had has a mesh, you know, the size of the entire belly. So I may need a little more time. So if we make this guy the second case rather than the first case or something along those lines, just to expedite things, because, you know, you, you can run into trouble and there are some challenges that can occur. So, um, some risk factors that that I think we've identified that increase the risk of, of vascular injury during these cases. So obviously if they've had previous anterior approaches of the spine or previous retroperitoneal surgery, I think that increases the risk. Um, it's kind of good to identify those patients that may have large osteophytes or significant spondylolisthesis because I think during the dissection that, that can increase the risk of a vascular injury. Uh, transitional anatomy has been reported as a, as a risk factor for, for vascular injury. Do you, do you find that to be a higher risk factor for patients with transitional it anatomy? It can be, you know, the guy goes back to looking at the MRI beforehand, just knowing what, where the vessels are. And you know, sometimes they'll treat a four or five, more like a five, one exposure and vice versa. So. Um, previous infections in the spine definitely can increase that risk and increase scarring in that area. Uh, and obviously peripheral vascular disease and smoking history. Um, it's good to kind of elucidate before you go in and that, you know, that's part of the reason why I send, send these patients to my vascular surgery colleagues to, to evaluate for some of these things and kind of assess that risk. Um, during surgery, uh, we, you know, we commonly use pulse flexibility oximetry in the left, in the foot um, and neuromonitoring, including SSCPs to kind of assess for any perfusion changes to the leg um, um, during the surgery. Um, and, uh, you know, here, you know, during surgery, we, we really rely on, on the vascular surgery colleagues to kind of to kind of get us through the, the approach. Um, identification and ligation uh, of, of these pertinent vessels, such as middle sacral artery and iliolumbar vein, is, is really important um, and to do it properly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's important for me to have a vascular surgeon that's very well trained in these approaches. They know exactly how much they can retract and how much they can get away with on the vascular chair before before we start to have some perfusion issues. Um, blood pressure management in collaboration with the anesthesiologists, uh, especially in response to changes in, in pulse proximity or SSCPs, 
I can keep the legs perfused. Um, when I'm doing these surgeries, I usually have, you know, the vascular surgeon literally hold the retractor still while I'm trialing and in between trialing and just prep preparation so that um, the, the retractors don't move. Uh, and they're frequently expect, inspecting the operative field in between my trialing and, 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 and disc, prep, uh, disc prepping to just make sure there's no vessels sneaking out from underneath the retractor blades that could get into the operative field that I could destroy on my way in. <laughs> um, as far as management of vascular injury, um, I'm sure Alex can tell you much more about that. Um, I think um, it seems like the trend is becoming more and more with, with venous injuries instead of directly repairing it, um, you're just packing it closed. With yeah, so just product. as one of those things is a trick, um, I know you guys are vascular people, so, yeah. um, but usually I haven't put a stitch into a vein in like three or four years now. And so I simply use what's called Pacasil patch, which is hemostatic patch, and you can put it right over the hole. You just hold it there for about 30 seconds and it's like magic. And so uh, it's either Tacoseal or Everest. Tacoseal. Yeah. And so you can fix up to almost a centimeter size hole in the vein with that patch. You just make a good size patch, you put it over the vein, hold pressure, and that's it. So I think once you start throwing stitches in that little tiny hole, you're more likely to rip make it and worse. make the injury worse. So, yeah. <laughs> I you might be it, able to. It's I don't know. It's you know. Use it for that. It's have you ever seen that infomercial where the guy's got the boat and it's got the leak? It's like the flexus seal, whatever thing. It's kind of like that. You just stick it on there and it's like that. Yeah, so. and we'll just throw it on there. We'll just forget about it. We'll run the surgery. We'll come back and look at it at the end. And by that time, it almost always healed. Um, and then you know, there's always direct repair of that vessel lacerations. And if, you know, if the injury is big enough, especially the arterial side, then it's, you know, it's paramount to have vascular surgery there. Uh, in some rare cases, have you ever had to ligate something like an iliac vein? Uh, no, fortunately not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then obviously, you know, if there's a if it's a thrombosis, uh, the vascular surgery can really help facilitate. You know, if there's an endovascular method that needs or some sort of thrombectomy or st uh, stenting. Um, Postoperatively, um, some vascular surgeons will independently round on on these patients uh, afterwards. Uh, if they don't, then it's really important to have close communication with the vascular surgeons in the postoperative period. Um, you know, make sure you're examining, especially the left lower extremity, for any signs of, of underperfusion or thrombosis. Um, thrombos thrombosis can occur in a, in a pretty delayed fashion. Um, sometimes you'll get retrofractional hematomas that can be expanding. And so, um, you know, I maintain really good communication with my vascular surgeon afterwards. And, um, you know, we're you know, we, you know, they're always available 24 seven and that's important, especially in the first couple of days after these, after these surgeries. Um, as far as improving workflow efficiency with vascular surgeons, um, you know, uh, if you're doing, if you're someone that does a lot of standalone a lifts, you can usually pack a few of those in, in a single day. Uh, and that's pretty efficient use of, of both surgeons time. Uh, I back up a lot of my a lifts with brick screws in the back. Um, and so, you know, I've always been trying to come up with ways to, to better utilize their time and make, make our days more efficient. You know, if you can have some sort of uh, paradigm set up where we have multiple operating rooms and while one, uh, while I'm doing the poster instrumentation after one A lift, the, the vascular surgeon could be starting the, the operative exposure on the, with the enter approach on and the next room over. And then you can kind of stagger it and really improve your workflow. Um, I do some deformity surgeries as well. And so oftentimes I'll stage these operations where I'll do multiple inner bodies on one day. And then I take them back after getting a scoliosis x-ray after that inner body approach to see how much I need to correct them from the back or what needs to be done from the back. So if I do it in a stage way like that, I can do a couple of those, a couple of those patients with their first stage in one day, and then bring them back for the posterior instrumentation on, on the second day for both those patients. Um, and I find that, that that really improves workflow as well. I don't know if you have any, any other ways to kind of maximize workflow between you and... Well, and you know, so, yeah, I mean, you always get more efficient the more that you do. I think one of the newer things, and, you know, it goes... I don't know how you guys are, but I'm a little OCD. So working with another surgeon, overcoming that was a challenge. Um, but, you know, and you... How do I say this? When I started, we were doing supine A-lift. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have introduced the single position or the lateral A-lift, 
That I think really improves the workflow because you can do the posterior component of the operation simultaneously with the anterior component and there's no flip. So that's great for me because I don't have to wait for another you know, hour for the posterior component to finish because usually it's done while I'm closing up the front. Um, but it's hard to convert people to do a new procedure when you're good at an old procedure um, that works well. So, um, you know, and everything has got a learning curve. So I think a lot of it is kind of what I tell my six year old, you have to be patient a little bit sometimes and learn how to do things correctly and you'll figure it out. And I think that's the importance of the good communication and kind of mutual respect, I think is part of a big part of that. So. Great. Oh, so, actually, I have one. Are you done? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, my last comment. Um, so I was very fortunate to come to San Diego when I finished my training. And like I said, I didn't really have any experience doing this. So I was fortunate there were a lot of people around who did, who were able to kind of help me because there's no real way to learn the, you know, to be a good access surgeon because not really, there's no formal training in it. And uh, if you look on YouTube, some of the videos, it's not particularly helpful. <laughs> so... Um, you know, so we actually recently started a spinal access surgical society. So if you have access surgeons who want to be a part of that, they are welcome. Uh, we'll have a textbook out, I think in the next calendar year, which will be helpful hopefully for some folks. Um, and that's it, you know, and I think every, you know, the access guys are, you know, varying experience levels if they're just starting or they, they've done, you know, 10,000. Um, I think just having a good relationship is the biggest thing being able to communicate freely with each other. And what I tell, you know, I do a lot of the educational stuff for guys who are just starting to do a lift and, you know, it's a wonderful operation, but my favorite saying, or actually I actually have two favorite sayings. My first favorite saying regarding a lift is it's like flying an airplane, taking off is optional landing is mandatory. So if you are not comfortable at the beginning, it takes time. So I think in general, the learning curve is about 10 cases before you can do the operation safely. And I tell most people, after you do about 200, then I think you become fairly proficient in the speed, efficacy, reproducibility of the operation. So, and like anything, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So that's it. Thank you. All right, guys.